as someone who's been doing this for about 20 years, and then I really only started... And I had been a home recordist on four track and things like that in the olden times, but um, really only in the maybe past nine or ten years have I gotten into like knowing how to record. And I would tell any young person, please learn because we're just living in an era of, well, however, however you want to fall on the side of the whole <clears throat> era of content that we're living in. Um, it's a good thing, and and then you also get to be fun and creative and weird too. So. Um, I think it's a win-win. I mean, I've been following you for, I think, probably since about the second record. And the first record is certainly more lo-fi DIY. Uh, given the, the scenes that you run in, as it were, and the kind of music that you play, I, I, I guess I would have pegged you as kind of a, a home recording kind of guy. I mean, and yes, I w- again, like I come from that four-track background. And surprisingly, I mean, Echolocation, you're right that it's kind of lo-fi it actually isn't in in so far as i recorded it with brian deck in a really nice recording studio with great gear but i feel like the writing was probably kind of <laughs> it's it's almost like i was lo-fi <laughs> my singing was lo-fi and my writing was kind of lo-fi and it has a, a handcrafted it's a it has a very first album vibe to it because it was like you know it's like when you're young and you're like i might never do this again and you put every idea into it and but it's still kind of a mess but maybe it's kind of a a charming mess in some way but and yeah and i had come from this very living room bedroom kind of cassette four track background um but yeah it really wasn't until i started getting gigs as a film composer that i i was sort of forced to do it because then you know, I started working with producers and being like, cool, I don't need to, I don't need to do this, but um, now I'm really glad I know how. When you were recording Echolocation, do you thought that that might just be the beginning and end of it all? Yes, I I was, Um, I think like, and I've, I've talked a little bit about this before and I try not to over romanticize it. And also it's so hard to remember sometimes how you've felt about things but i was this midwest kid and more or less kid still at the time and i was i really was um i think unambitious is a term i use a lot because that's sort of how i remember it i probably wasn't as unambitious as i remember but but clueless and sort of like i had i've generally always been pretty good at setting small goals and i i was just sort of like every single experience is like great i did that (laughs) So, and then you sort of get a little taste for maybe what the next step can be. And you, you sort of build upon that. It's, it's sort of a, it's a pragmatism that sometimes handicapped me a little bit because I didn't, uh, I, 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 I was, I just wasn't the guy who woke up in the morning and was ready to slay dragons all day long. I was a little bit just like, if I make my little record, that's going to make me so happy. But, um, I think cause I, yeah, I just sort of grew up this, this kind of dreamy kid who, who just didn't, no one in my family was from uh, uh, the arts or entertainment or anything like that. So just to be able to like go into a recording studio with like a a cool guy from a cool band that I liked who was going to record my music, that was like, that was all I needed um, at the time. And then, yeah, you just sort of, but you get a little, little nugget of the taste for the next step and I just kept going, I guess. So there weren't grand ambitions to be in, in an indie rock band at that point. I wouldn't. There was there was uh, there were ambitions, but yes, not grand ones, <laughs> just sort of small ones. And and that was also uh, and again, like so much of this is is like it's a, the frosted lens of of nostalgia and the past. It's a little. It's sometimes hard for me to remember, but it was a simpler time. It was kind of easier to do. Some some things were much easier to do back then. Some things were harder to do. Too. You certainly, like the aforementioned make your own record at home was not as easy to, to pull off. Um, but it was, uh, I had these, I just had these small goals. I, I started playing in Caliphone, which is sort of how I got echolocation made. Um, I don't even think I told Tim that I made my own music until we had been on tour for, we'd been like sitting in a van with each other for six months or something. And I was like, oh, by the way... <laughs> And gave him some of my demo tapes, which he liked, and and that that sort of set me off. But um, it was it was certainly going on those early tours and and interacting with bands like Modest Mouse and The Shins, who I, I was sort of seeing things take off. But it was these kind of people that didn't seem totally different from me. I think before then, I was like, if you if you are gonna make it, you have to be David Bowie or something like that and uh just just sort of like uh indie rock was a very like proof of concept kind of 
structure back then. It was it was uh, there there was something pretty grounded about it. So it was good, like going on some of those tours and and just seeing how the how the gears worked a little bit and and that it was not as crazy as you think. And then you sort of go and you take that and go with it a little bit. So that was uh, yeah, th- that was just like. That was such, it was an education, basically. It's interesting that you had this very close relationship with him. And obviously, you know, you were in the, all the confines that come along with touring. And yet you, it took you six months to show him your music. Were you ashamed of it? Was it just something that you weren't really thinking much about? I was not ashamed of it at all, but I was, um, I kind of, uh, I think uh, I sort of grew up a little bit with the like, don't show off too much uh, principle in the family or something. It was just like, it seemed I was always creative. I was always making stuff, but it was always very like a little bit. I I think I had part of me possibly from upbringing part, partially just kind of like baked into my Midwestern psyche or something of uh, don't toot your own horn, which literally is like, that does not extend to give your demo tape to someone that you've, are pretty close with and you've known a long time. But at the time I was young enough to think, and I, I probably was a little embarrassed because Tim from Califone was a hero and um, I looked up to him and it, it, it just took me a little while to gain the courage to, to show him. And, and actually like when I listen to those songs now, I'm like, I probably should have been a little embarrassed <laughs> to be, I mean, they're good. But uh, again, it was a different time. There was sort of a, like, I've said this time and time again lately, you, you got to be really like fully baked now uh, coming out of the gates. If you're a young songwriter, like uh, you have to sort of be ready to, for it to all click into place. And um, But back then there kind of was like a minor league that you could start in a little bit. There were, there was a developmental act. Uh, like you could, you could, there was a D league basically for young songwriters. At least from, from my perspective and, and from somebody who has followed your career to some degree, there definitely seems to be a pretty marked change between that first and second record. I mean, from the standpoint of like, I tend to think of that second record as really being a kind of a proper fruit rats record in the way that the first one isn't necessarily. And for me, I almost think of the, the, fourth record really as the starting point for me the ruminant band record which came out in 2009 ruminant band was the third sub pop record and it uh was it was really i had played in the shins at that point and that was speaking of another like get out into the world for a few years see how this whole other level works um and and you know just another sort of little stone to add to the to the sort of road to wherever it was I was going, A, that gave me um, sort of a miraculous uh, independence financially, which is not to say it didn't make me some kind of rich person, but it um, it was, I was able to not have day jobs anymore. You were a professional musician, truly. Yeah, I became a professional musician with that. And it was like, you get the taste for that. And you're like, well, I can't, I'm, I gotta, I have to like keep trying to do this for as long as I can, because um, it felt really good. And uh, and again, it was just seeing this, seeing the kind of the highest level you could see in indie rock for a, a hot minute, too. And um, so I I feel like the Ruminant Band record, I was I was really myself on that one too. But there was a, there was a a touch of ambition too with like how it felt. In a lot of ways, the the Fruit Bats previous to that was kind of a different band, and we don't really play those songs from those records, and I'm not for any weird reason either and i still play when you love somebody and stuff like that but but uh in a way it's like i I felt like i came i kind of came to my uh, into my own as a songwriter with that record if you can kind of distill it what is the difference between room in a band and everything before it everything before it was still very much from a four track mentality even though i was working with producers it was still like there's not a lot of drumming on those records there's a lot of like percussion and things like that it still was like i was i think i was still trying to do something that was very um i used to call it a band in a box um like small uh, small and contained and maybe kind of epic but like epic in this sort of really tiny way and um always found that incredibly hard to then translate to live without I think you can, you could you could have a band like that, um, it, with a kind of a small, intimate sound, like something like Iron and Wine or something, 
which just that band did really well out of the gates. And then you can have kind of this, you can just go right to playing in theaters, <laughs> thousand seat theaters or something like that. And, and sort of having this intimate experience, but that's still like with this very controlled audience. But I was like trying to play these little mini epics that were these very tiny little living room songs, uh, just in noisy, a noisy bar in front of 30 people at a punk rock club. Um, I feel like Ruminant Band was a little bit of a, I was just kind of ready to have drums and, and have have something where we could turn the amps up a little bit. Um, so, it, you know, more of a, my first kind of rock record, I guess, which it's it's sort of been like that ever since. I mean, aside from this sort of, you know, this, I guess a taste of a good life with, with the shins, were there technical skills that you picked up from that experience that were you were able to translate into your own band? Yes. I mean, and th- th- that was all, that was, I was a side guy in a huge band um, and not like, an, I'm, I'm not a ringer musician, but I, I think James brought me in because I was their friend and I could sing really well harmonies. So, um, and especially like over the top of his voice, which is very high and mine's as high. And I could, I could sing the type of harmonies that he was singing. I even did some like doubling of his lead vocal, which, so I think that was why I was brought in and that I was sort of a um, jack of all trades of, of various instruments and, um, but Jin's is a deceptively uh, complicated band too. Like musically, it's very catchy uh, music, but it's like it's a lot of chords, like the Beatles or something like that, where you're just like, oh, I can play this, and then you sit down and you're like, there's like a hundred chords in here, and they're moving all over the place, and um, that music contains multitudes. So, and then and then it was, uh, and now play that on the biggest stages imaginable, like bigger than you've ever done so um it was a very uh classic frying pan into the fire thing or i hadn't even been in a frying pan i was in like a, a lukewarm saucepan into uh into a gigantic you were marinating yeah i was marinating very lightly do you get the sense that working closely with somebody like james mercer made you a better songwriter yeah i mean that dude's a great songwriter I, I, like working with anybody is gonna you're something working with any songwriter is gonna rub off on you so yeah like there's no way that 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 music didn't seep into my dna um and you know we had started at the same time and uh but i mean talk about a band my when i sort of mentioned before how uh you got to come screaming out of the gates as a as a as a early like like o inverted world is just like Oh my God! What a debut! Reading that Sub Pop, I recently did Sub Pop. I think was expecting to sell ten ten thousand and sold a hundred thousand in the first year or two. Yeah, that's a that's a a famous uh, a famous thing that Jonathan Poneman I think said to J- like pulled James aside and said like and ten thousand was an exciting notion again different time where he and where he was like he's like man I think we could sell ten thousand of that thing like uh, as in like what a great record this is going to do really well and not knowing that it would be far more successful than that so it sold um it's i think it's over five hundred thousand now on that i think that record is gold there were like a handful of there in that year that just felt like it was like potentially on the road to being never mind part two for sub pop there, there was yeah. like a second win right around that time period yeah and i was i was right in the mix there as the kind of uh not as successful friend to everybody but but I was still very much in the mix and kind of like the the team mascot <laughs> or something with the, those bands. And it was it was a very interesting, uh, interesting kind of fun time. It's a little bit of a blur to me now. I don't like, rem- you know, I don't rem- I'm not going to be able to reminisce about it in the way that people are like, oh, Laurel Canyon in the 70s or something like that. It was just like it was just a lot of crappy tours and <laughs> hanging out with people. But um, but yeah, it was it was as fun as as it can be when you're a 20 something driving around America playing music you don't get a sense of like jealousy of seeing some of your peers just completely shoot into the stratosphere i probably did at the time um i have been the especially the last few years have started to go really well like 18 years in for me and it's in a way i I feel there's a lot of reasons to feel happy about that one it's nice to be appreciated after a really really long time and have things kind of come together it's kind of nice to have it come at you slow maybe it's part of my personality or something like that you get to 
you get to sort of stay in a permanent honeymoon period. It just, it gets better like one inch per year, which is always nice. It's never, it's never an, I've had a few backward slides for sure, but for the most part, it's always like an average of a, of an inch forward, um, which is kind of nice. I, I haven't, uh, I haven't had like the big, the big craziness happen to me, but I get to play music and get paid to do it. And that's all I do, which, and that's just like, I'm very thankful for it. What does a backward slide feel like? It feel like, that would have been like around 2014 or so. And I had all this weird stuff happen and, and just kind of, and I, it was when I stopped, I stopped doing fruit bats for a while. Actually, that was probably like 20, that might've even been 2013 when I stopped doing it, but it felt kind of like, um, freeing in a strange way. Like, uh, maybe I'm gonna, I was doing this film stuff and, um, you know, maybe I'm gonna, uh, I'm going to like do a totally new thing. I want to become like a writer or something like that. But mostly it felt crappy <laughs> because, uh, you know, I had like, I had invested what seemed like years, uh, which it was years. I had, I had invested a lot in it and it didn't feel like it was paying off. But I think probably the sort of aforementioned, uh, quote unquote unambition or whatever, whatever it was that I had early on that, that even kept me from giving my demo tapes out um, may have been a secret weapon for something like that because I was I, I think I think if you um, wake up in the morning and you're like the world owes me everything like from day one kind of thing and I'm a genius and and uh, and I think that's a great way to be and obviously like a lot of the best songwriters and musicians and and whoever probably are like that I would say if you're like that you're probably you're either going to be a huge star or like a homeless person or dead under a bridge or something because there's sort of there's only two places you can go with that there's no plan b yeah there's no plan b so i think i always had such a, a sort of a boutique outlook for so long that um taking a few steps back i was like it didn't feel great but it felt a little bit like i've been here before and i'll i'll, I'll wiggle my way out of this um, and I did. But you were seriously considering getting out of the game? I mean, I made the EDJ record. I sort of changed the name of the band. It was like this. It was. I had a bit of a, maybe a musical identity crisis for a minute. And not an identity crisis that made bad art or anything like that. I think made a cool record out of it. But just the notion of like, maybe I retire this name and I'm, I'll am i shed it and I'll I'll start anew or something. And, and honestly, the mid the mid 2010s was not a good time to be like starting be like 30 something year old singer songwriter starting a new thing so which I, I don't think i thought of that at the time yeah i think i don't i don't know what i thought because you it's just like it's such a weird roller coaster doing this anyway that yeah i don't think i knew what i thought i, I guess i sort of like am under the impression that not all but that a lot of especially indie musicians you know where there does as you said even like with the shins there's kind of there's a relative ceiling i think of how far you can get playing this genre of, mu of music in this period of time that like a lot of people are just kind of going through their life with some semblance of what a plan b might look like or like you know if this all comes crashing down what what I'm going to do with my life. And every single, I've, I've kind of come to realize, because like 90% of my friends do the same thing as me. So I have a lot of, I have a, a decent sample size of, of people that who I'm close to, who I can sort of be like, what's your life like? You know, get, I, I, have, I have a sense of what different people's lives are like. And if you took your, if you took 15 bands of around the same size, and by same size, I mean, whatever that means, like, followers on social media or spotify listens or like concert ticket sales or or what whatever that all means um if you took 15 of them of, of around approximately the same sort of popularity level you would find that uh, each whoever the principal is of that band or the band members um each of their lives financially and otherwise is probably dramatically different there, there's not a it's it's not like um it's not some entry level job or something where you're all making some sort of like baseline salary or whatever it's it's weird everybody everybody's reality is um deeply all over the place mine included so it's it's also like beyond the people i know i'm just like yeah i don't i don't know how it works for any i don't know how anybody makes this work really it's a it's a bit of an affliction but um and sometimes people win, win the big wars and they get the, they get a huge commercial sync or something and it just it makes their whole year and sometimes they nobody they don't get that at all but maybe they sell a couple more tickets live or they have other projects that they uh, they do and 
I, so a few years ago, I talked to James Toth of Wooden Wand, and he, and this is something, this is a sentiment a lot of people have told me, but I think he really um, articulated it the best, which is, I think they were playing Babies All Right in Brooklyn at the time, and he 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 just said, you know, attendance is it's been it's been going down, and and I can't. I don't know if it's indie rock fans of a certain age just getting older and having kids and and not just wanting to come out to shows. I don't know if it's me. I don't know if it's the industry, but like, you know, things are kind of going in, in the wrong direction, or at least, you know, I I haven't spoken to him in a few years and, you know, maybe things have been on the upswing, but like at the time it was just this very kind of stark conversation that I think like he and a lot of probably your contemporaries need to kind of have with themselves, which is like, at what point does the math of doing this stop making sense? Yeah. I've, I mean, I've talked with, with countless of my peers about it. And again, totally like that's a common story. And especially as, as we get older and just different, different audiences come in and out and and different things. So yeah, it is like, I'm, those are my people though. I love them. I want, I want everybody to do really well. (laughs) But at the same time, you can't begrudge someone for realizing like, you know, this is not that, that I, I just, I can't really, I can't live off this anymore. No. And I, I mean, I think back to tours I had. So I actually, I feel like I've told this anecdote before, but it's, it bears, bears repeating, which was, I remember uh, running into a friend in, I don't know, several years back now who I hadn't seen in a really long time, musician friend of mine who still plays music, but not, not quite on, on like a touring basis or anything like that. But he, he ended up coming to a show and we reconnected after several years. And he's like, man, the last time I saw you was 2006, the Spelled and Bones tour. And you told me after this tour, I quit. And I was like, I don't even remember. I, I didn't remember saying that at all to him. And I was like, man, that seemed like a good tour or fun, like a, a fine, fun tour. But um, apparently I was... Apparently, I've said that a million times, I guess. So, um, and there are definitely tours that I think back to where I'm like, I probably should have quit. That's the one where like a sane person quits after that tour. Um, just years of tours where no one came to the shows, you know, just empty every single night for a really, really long time. So I'm a glutton for punishment. I think I think a lot of us are. Yeah. So, I mean, what what is that kind of that affliction, I guess, or that compulsion that you have where you should have but didn't is it the expectation that if you keep doing it things are going to get better probably that which is probably probably uh, the aforementioned affliction yeah it's probably a little bit of crazy magical thinking um i think i i chalk mine up to because you would think after all this talk of me being this pragmatic unambitious person that i probably would have stopped and done something more normal um a i don't have a college degree or any marketable skills um so I'm not, I don't really know what I would do per se. I would probably do something equally weird <laughs> and challenging. Whenever I think of the alternate career paths I might have, I'm like, they're all as equally difficult to the one I have chosen. So like a novelist or a painter or. Yeah, just, it's going to be something in the arts or entertainment and just something, something weird like that. And I've, and I've dabbled in all kinds of other stuff like that. And some of it, it's like, I've, I've seen how hard it all can be. And at least like in this case, you, you, you have a history and you've been doing it and people, you know, you have name recognition, you know, at this point in your life, starting over and beca- and trying to become a painter, I think would be a, a much more difficult. Yeah. And I'm definitely not going to become a painter because I definitely don't know how to paint, but I, yeah, I think it's that the sort of one, one inch per year thing that I have, I've had, except for like the couple of big back kind of falling back things, but. But overall you're, you, you can see that you're going the right way. I can see I'm going the right way. And then I also, I am a um, small goal setter and a, a small victory enjoyer. So I, I have never once uh, had a, like some kind of big life changing, like, you know, commercial sink or something for where it's like your whole, your pay for two years is like set kind of thing with, uh, I am, but I am, I've had a lot of, it seems like once a year I get a small victory that's just like it's just like a little uh piece of food uh to keep going. So it's it's really the small victories and the the inch at a time thing. It's a, it's a very like, you know, it's sort of a cliche, but it's a it's a tortoise in the hare uh, type uh type thing. I've heard you talk about it before and and it really you know, it seems like again you've been doing this for a long time, but it it seems like you kind of segment your career into two distinct periods. And like you said, you had this 
later in career success that again, you know, very few contemporaries at that level had. Do you get a sense of what happened? No. I mean, basically it's like, it's been the past four years have been awesome. And again, awesome, totally in a fruit bats way, <laughs> which still means like still a, a, a living wage kind of awesome. But like, um, you know, I'm not, the mansion has not been purchased yet. Um, but it's uh, the last four years have been all of a sudden got really good. And I think it I think it's possibly that I have I have stuck around. I have a, a stalwart fan base um, who seem to always there's a lot of fans from 20 years back who are still coming to shows. I'm friends with them at this point. Um, so there's that they I have like always kind of they've stuck around and then. I think with the song Humbug Mountain song that came out in 26, um, a huge wave of younger fans too. So it's like, we've had this crazy, um, it's a crazy mix of uh, these old guard fans who are probably my age-ish, um, mid forties. Um, and then much younger, like college age fans from who kind of came on during the absolute loser record. I don't know that for sure. Other than, there, there was like a visible change in the. I can. It's more of like a vis, visible change in the audience. You can, you can kind of see that um, has really gotten younger, which is awesome. So it's, it was a little bit of like a groundswell of like two or three different groups of people um, decide who either loved me before and just some new ones coming in. So it's like it's a snowball effect of uh, of fans that I'm really lucky to have had happen. What happened with that specific song? I think, well, it was like a, it became a crazy streaming phenomenon, which, uh, you know, obviously lots to unpack with streaming and everything, especially nowadays. And I, uh, like for me, that, that was, that just, that song was huge on like Spotify and places like that. I don't know why. Um, I think it, uh, maybe got on some playlists or something. I, I don't know why. It's a mystery to this day to me. Um, what happened with that song? We made a really funny video for it. Um, but and that record did fairly well and uh but that's like when we tour now um you'd be surprised certain audiences especially like an all ages show don't know any songs from before that record so it's they know everything from absolute loser and gold past life and maybe a few things from before but the um the it's all been sort of placed on the most recent work which again is a great great thing cuz it's it, it's the opposite of diminishing returns. I, I am kind of of or getting to that age where like ruminant fans still feels like a new record to me. <laughs> you know? there, there's just there's this weird thing that happens. I mean, like time generally, but there's a weird thing that happens around album releases where, you know, suddenly you wake up one day and albums that are 10 years old, you know, feel like a new release. Same here. <laughs> yeah. It's funny to hear that the Ruminant Band is almost like classified as the before time. It is. It kind of is. Yeah, it's 11 years old now. So, But I remember when Mouthfuls turned 10, which is the year I kind of shut down the band for a while or the, the project. And uh, it seemed like, like an impossible, possible length of time to have been going. Was stepping away from the band for a while, was that ultimately helpful in, in the, the path and growth of the band? Incredibly <clears throat> like pivotal if anything like i couldn't have chosen to do it uh better but it was at the time seemed like utter chaos but i stopped doing it i got a call in 2015 from i i stopped doing it i was doing the edj shows that was it was incredible it was a, a moment of incredible humility from you know what had been you know a slow very slow climb of a career that had eventually led by the time Ruminant Band and Tripper came out to some like some shows would be sold out, but still a lot of empty show. You know, it was a mixed bag of successes. Um, and when I did the EDJ thing, I lost all of my infrastructure, no agent, no manager, no nothing, which was fine. And I was like, all right, I'm a scrappy. I'm running a little cottage industry now. That sounds terrifying, by the way. <laughs> it was. Yeah. You almost you, you pulled the rug out from under yourself. Yeah, and then I was going around and, and even playing shows in towns, you know, where where Fruit Bats had at least kind of had a sort of a foothold, like Seattle, Portland, Chicago, sort of my my real home base places, and and no one was showing up to the shows, and um and I didn't have an agent either, so I was like booking shows myself, and and then and like couldn't even get 
couldn't even get just simple shows book. And it really, really went back to like the feeling of being in like a punk band and trying to get a Monday night slot at the, you know, local dive bar or something like that. And, you know, this was after a, a modest success with Brute Bats and, and also like living a crazy glory life with Shins too. So I had, I was like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm really like, uh, the, it was, it was, um, it was a dose of humility, but I kind of liked it in a way. It was, I did, uh, I did a tour opening for Delta Spirit, who were kind enough to invite me along. And uh, but the audiences, you know, they were there to get rocked. And seeing me play solo with looping pedals beforehand, it was like every other night was a real slog. Like, I mean, definitely booing and heckling and stuff like that. Sometimes at worst, at best, ambivalence and and generally in the middle, kind of like just people talking over it <laughs> or something. So it was, uh, you know, it was I was not being glorified or anything like that after a, a what it felt like an illustrious 14 year year career i was still kind of i was really grinding it out for like a minute there um but it didn't i actually like the delta spirit tour i still look back one of my most fun tours it was really long i was totally by myself it was awesome i, I ordered a lot of room service um i didn't get paid a lot but it was like because i didn't have to have pay anyone or bring anyone i actually made money on the tour and it was it was sort of fun in in a way and i the audience abuse was not awesome but it was uh <laughs> it was character building so and and i had i had been there before too so but i uh yeah it all kind of it it also led me back to be like this is stupid that i did this and i should it's ridiculous that i have had this band that just has a band name but it's just me and it doesn't ha we didn't have to break up and when My Morning Jacket asked me to do the tour in 2015, that same way, which was going to be on even bigger stages, um, I just said, like, well, let's just let's just have it be a Fruit Bats tour then. So, and it was like, and that was the best tour ever, basically. So, sorry, you touched on this a little bit, but what, what was the what was the impetus behind the name change? Um, it was a, kind of the thing I was a little bit the thing I was saying about how <clears throat> I had always flirted with name changes a million times it was the thing i was saying about the pre ruminant band records where i was just like it doesn't feel like fruit bats is a good name that's a, i mean that's a good that's a good band name i i i don't even really remember choosing it um but it was partly i wrote it i think as a fake punk band name on a four track tape or something cuz i would sort of ma i would make four track tapes and make fake band names it was a fake band name but i also i liked it cuz it sounded kind of elemental at the time like it just seemed like a very simple animal name for a band yeah i've come around on it but yeah i th i think i like i've had co a complicated history with just sort of being the person with a band name and you'll you'll see a lot of there's a lot of uh similar artists who um are the single person with the band name and you will notice a lot of them change their name the uh smog smog becomes bill callahan bonnie like J james toth did james toth for a while yeah and then like like yeah um bonnie prince billy has had a several several different band names and uh, who else like plenty yeah i think it's like it's always weird when you sort of pick a band name and maybe you think you can you can sort of do something different and, um and make a big swing but I'm, I'm glad i came back to it because uh for whatever reason and, and now i have a large catalog of it too that's uh i can kind of go back to and and be like historically yeah maybe you're not gonna totally connect with songs you wrote when you were 24 but maybe maybe you are i mean you're obviously somebody who can and has played nice with others you know the bonnie light horseman stuff and and other bands that you've been in over the years why didn't fruit bats ever really become a proper band i wanted it to be early on it, it was, this was sort of just like a a function of um this is a common story too with a lot of bands that's that's happened especially back then too. I think I, I wanted it to be, and then um, you would sort of get people involved. We'd go out on a tour, and the tours were terrible for the first four or five years. No one was there, so it was like it be, people just get in varying levels of investment in it, um, and uh, it's starting like a quote unquote band like the Beatles you know, in like a hard day's night living in bunk beds all together and being best chum. <laughs> yeah, it's it's um it's something that in the twenty first century is like it's a kind of a bygone 
thing. Um, so I have like some friends who are in a very kind of ba- actual band construct and, and others who aren't. Probably more people I know are more do what I do. Um, but yeah, it was just like, I, I think I wanted it. And I think probably if, if I'd have like exploded out of the gates or something, we could have, it could have been that way um, because it was just going to be easy. And that, that's kind of what happened with Shins early on too. It was like, it was very much James's project too, with kind of a, his friends from Albuquerque. Um, but that sort of kind of golden era lineup with, of Shins that sort of culminated in me becoming the fifth member. That was like, that was very much that where it was just like, all right, well, this is going to be the band and we're going to be able to just, we're huge now. There it is. They seem like a case that actually started off as a band and then just became James's thing. Well, they started off as flake music and Shins was the side project that was just James. So yes and no, it's like, it's, it's complicated, but they're, they're all, all those stories are kind of like that. Um, and especially of like, of my friends who ha- sort of have bands or nom de plume kind of bands. It's like the stories are all a little different variations on that, but it usually has something to do with like who can handle <laughs> those early days i certainly had lineups of the band where i was like there was different people who were like oh i'd love for that person to be kind of a permanent member and uh so many times those people bailed because um probably because i was not i was i'm sure i was not the easiest person to deal with just being a young young sort of uh hopeful songwriter person um I think I was probably, I'm sure I was not the awesomest guy sometimes. And we're, it's like five of us sleeping in one Motel 6 room every night and playing to nobody. It's just like, this doesn't make you feel great, but still also very fun, of course, at that age. I mean, I suspect that, you know, kind of getting kicked in the ass over the course of 20 years has probably made you a hum- humbler and easier person to get along with. 100%. Yeah. And I'm like, don't alienate your bandmates. Like, but it's, it's, um, it's much easier. It's you. We have a much better time now. That's for sure. We have we have people who help us now, and we're still in a van. Um, but like everybody gets their own room now. And there's there's a uh, just in the past couple of years, it's like we didn't do the thing of like let's just get a bus and whatever because we certainly we're not at that level. But it's uh there is a a little bit of a comfort level, and I I'm also able to pay everybody relatively well too. So there's that because on those early tours also um, no one got paid because there was no money. That is certainly one of the upsides of having not only a fluid lineup, but having the ability to kind of just peel yourself off and perform solo is you're kind of, you're more malleable and you're more portable in that way. Yeah. I still don't really make money on tour, which is, you hear people say it time and time again. And, and again, a million different scenarios for how that, for why that's a thing. Because I've heard that for a lot of people, it, it, it's just the tour. Because like streaming is a really difficult way to make a living. Yes, and I tour is like I make almost nothing. You know, like a break even is definitely a success, and then occasionally I'll make a little something. But but like usually it's and I didn't. I, a lot of bands make the mistake of like you kind of start doing a little bit better and you do the thing like i'm gonna we're gonna get a bus and we're gonna start staying in like only four star hotel you know you you uh, you up it way too quick and then then it's really a disaster and i've seen that happen with several friends bands and i um learned from their mistakes so i didn't do that but i you know you we i did i've added little tiny perks that just make you know entering a 20th year on the road a more pleasant thing (laughs) for somebody my age and uh and so Again, that just co- you basically the more money you make, the more money you kind of want to spend. But I'm trying to trying to be as like smart about it as possible, but but also live as well as possible and have everybody be as happy as possible. Um, especially bandmates, that's like very important to me. So I say this as somebody who like just had like the Bush Tetras on the band on the sh- on the show or like or Wire a few episodes back or like you, know, you said Bruce Hornsby. Like you know, obviously, like you're not. You're not old, but you are getting older. Do you, do you find that it's like there are certain aspects of touring that are just, you know, har- harder on the body or just generally more difficult as you age? Well, in in the middle of coronavirus, if you'd asked me that, like, in January of this year, I would have been like, yes, it's terrible. And right now I'm like, oh, I miss it. <laughs> yes, it's it's hard on the body for sure. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And it's we like live really well on tour and everything and, and eat well and all that in the early days of tour. I remember we would, we would drive around in the van, everyone smoking cigarettes, like, like with the 
windows rolled up in the van in the wintertime, and it was, it was just really ridiculous, and you always just felt really crusty every morning. I remember kind of feeling, and also drinking more and things like that. I remember always kind of feeling worse when I was in my 20s touring, but probably I lived much. I ate worse. Sm- I smoked and drank more, like partied more, which I think is pretty common. So in a way, I'm like, um, I probably, I feel a little better now than I did, but that's only because I'm, I have to fight against uh, not doing all that dumb stuff that I used to do 20 years ago. What role is, is music playing in your everyday life now during the lockdown? It's like, it's all encompassing. It wasn't for the first uh, couple months. I was, I really was, you know, just anxious. Like I think everybody and, um, and I still of course am, but um, I've been just busy and, and I made a whole new Fruit Bats record all entirely at home. I made a whole, that's cover of Smashing Pumpkin Siamese Dream also at home. So, you know, I'm, I probably, I, I am busy and I'm supposed to be doing these things, but also it's a very good way to avoid staring into the void too. So I am, and I'm a busybody in general, even when there's not a global pandemic swirling around. Uh, yeah, it's become really huge and I'm happy that I have it. And and sort of, I, I feel like, you know, talking about being like, there's other things I could be doing, you know, if I'm, I'm going to blow it all up and do something else. Like lately, I've, things have been kind of going well. And I'm like, um, really doubling down on just being fruit bats or Bonnie Light Horseman or just doubling down on being like, wow, I have these things that like, work for me and that, that I get to do. And um, I'm, I'm honoring them. It does put things into perspective. <laughs> you know, like I was telling somebody earlier today that which is something I never expect myself to say but I, I usually travel a lot for work and like i miss hotels which is just such just like a silly thing but like there's just something about being in a hotel that is nice that i have not experienced in a while maybe it's anything that would get me out of this apartment but you start to miss the the things that you you hated yeah no i miss hotels i miss airports i looked at my hotels.com because we use that as our sort of how we buy our hotels on tour so i you know you get like free rooms and i I still have like from just the last couple tours because the bonnie night horseman they use my account as well so we have like all these tours and i have like nine free hotel rooms right now or something that normally i would just put into a tour to try to save some money but like i have nine free hotel rooms but i don't really i don't have anywhere to go (laughs) right now i mean maybe maybe i'll go somewhere but what's the connection between lockdown and doing an entire cover of a smashing pumpkins record well that was a thing that i i got sort of tapped to do long before this and i had been kind of procrastinating it working on other things and being like i'll get to that there wasn't i i got tasked with doing it i even got like a sort of a small budget and i was like i was definitely knew i was going to do it myself and sort of do this very handcrafted uh weird version of siamese dream but i um, I put it off for a really long time just because I was doing other things and touring and everything too. And I, I, it, I wasn't putting it off because it was unimportant. I was putting it off because it was important and I wanted to be able to, you want to do it well. Yeah. I want to do it well. And then of course this came along. So I was like, all right. And then again, it took me a month to just get over the incredible anxiety about the state of the world to even want to start on something like that. But, um, so I eventually I did that. And then uh, right after that, um, I knew that I was going to start on the new Fruit Bats record and was actually supposed to be in New York starting work on it in March, um, which obviously did not come to pass. And Josh Kaufman, who's my bandmate in Bonnie Light Horseman, produced the Bonnie Light Horseman record, um, did the new Fruit Bats record too. So we ended up doing it. I did it, basically got started right after Siamese Dream on the new one with Josh's producer, but sort of long, pulling the strings long distance and um, a, like a completely, you know, cross country, uh, cross country via telephone and a postal service kind of situation. A postal service kind of situation, exactly. Yeah. Were, were the songs written in quarantine? Yeah, I mean, like, I had. I think I came in with eight songs that were written before, but I chucked four of them. So it's like four pre-quarantine songs, which are weirdly quarantine-y sounding. I don't know why. They were very prescient. But, um, and then, yeah, and it is, uh, I'm sure everybody and their mother is going to have a quarantine record come out in the next uh, year or so. So I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm hesitating to call it that. 
but uh, it's certainly yeah there's i don't think anybody make writing anything right now i think it's going to be hard for most people to for that not to inform them somehow i what does quarantine mean it just they, were, were they like claustrophobic no it's more lyrically it's i think it's it's a lyrical thing it's not the music's not claustrophobic it's certainly like i think um and i don't want to i don't even like not well, I, we just finished it like three days ago, so I'm, I haven't even really like formulated. Uh, this would be the first time I've really talked about it, but um, it's um, yeah, it's a it's a, a bit of a dreamier record. It's it's like uh, it's a little more handcrafted seeming, I think, but still kind of big. But it's it's more lyrical. Um, it's a bit apocalyptic, I think. Things have been pretty bad for a while so i'm sure that that was important it's like it's not like lockdown started and things went to shit yeah there's a lot of uh yeah there's a lot of longing in it i think too so again i haven't like totally formulated it but but you'll you'll hear and you'll you'll know what i'm talking about it's like a yeah it's a my the i think i did the concept of the record is it's about uh how the world is um ridiculous and horrible and beautiful all at once. So just doing a project like Bonnie, like horseman or doing, you know, Siamese dream in its entirety. Do those have tangible effects on the subsequent fruit bats work? Yes. Um, Siamese dream definitely did just in that it was, uh, it was, um, I did them back to back and it got me prepped in the space and everything too. So whatever it was that I provided on this record as a performer or like a decision maker on my end of the sort of Josh was producing it, but whatever I was doing as an engineer and kind of quote co-producer uh, from the other end was sort of informed by what I had learned making that. And that record was, is a crazy one to make during quarantine too, because it's this, it actually lyrically, it's very like it's angsty and, and it's about isolation and, uh, desperation and it's it's uh it like really kind of went <laughs> with the whole vibe so um yeah i think a lot of it informed that and then the bonnie light horseman stuff informed it in a huge way in that we had made that record with josh who I, i've been friends with and collaborated with for years but never had used as a producer and uh where i was like it was such a great experience making that record that i was like oh we should we should do this again in a fruit bats. Con- I, I'd be curious to hear how his touch works in a fruit bats context. And it's very much like it turned out really cool. And it's, it's very much his touch on the record. Does it feel more like a, a band effort in that way? Or, or, you know, more a collaboration in the sense of being, you know, in, in a band with somebody in terms of like having a, a creative collaborator? I mean, yes, absolutely. But I had that with Tom Monahan as well on the previous few records. So, and I, that's how I approach using a producer. I, I've produced records myself. I, I'm certainly capable at, from the technical end to like make one. Um, and I've been around a long time too and made a lot of records. So I don't, I'm not like a babe in the woods. If I'm bringing a producer in, I don't, it's not like some uh, fatherly figure that's going to, um, you know, make sure I don't stumble over myself. It's not, it's not going to be like Rico Kasich. Yeah. 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 But I, but at the same time, I do want a producer because, um, I just, I, I love the notion of just another mind coming in. So you like, um, when I've worked with Tom in the past and Brian Deck before that, and Brian really was, he truly was kind of shepherding me because I was really young when I was making those records. So he, he's very much in those, but, um, working with Tom a lot, um, he's such a, you know, it's just, um, someone to, uh, invite into your brain a little bit and, and interpret, uh, interpret things that, um, maybe you wouldn't, uh, that it's, it's handing something from your subconscious over to somebody and seeing what they would do with it. Um, rather than knowing exactly what you would do with it. This is something I wanted to touch on because when we first started talking, you uh, you had mentioned that um, you were making a lot of music, but that you weren't really able to listen to music much during this time. Yeah. For one thing, this is a, a thing I have strongly discovered about myself. Um, you hate that music? I, that I hate music, <laughs> yeah. Um, that and no, I don't hate music. I love music, 
but that I'm a car, I listen in the car. Like that, that's my place that I listen to music. I live in LA, so I spend a lot of time in, and I, I live in LA. And then when I'm not living in LA, I'm on tour. So I am, a, I am a creature of the car. So, and obviously still driving in the car now, but not to as many places or, and, and sometimes long stretches of like being like, wow, I haven't like gotten in the car in like a week or something e- easily. Um, so I, um, that's like one thing I realized this is like, I'm a, I'm a car listener. I've even sort of been thinking about setting aside some listening days of just driving around, um, which probably just be good for the car to get driven (laughs) a few times too, but, but also as an excuse to listen to music. I certainly have listened to some music at home, but I have, uh, I am a weird music listener. I don't know if I'm like the, I'm not, um. I'm so close to music too that like sitting around and sort of passively listening to it while sitting feels strange somehow to me. Do you find that like as a professional musician who's been doing it for so long that you can't really passively listen to it? That you're, you know, in the same way that like as a, for me as a professional writer or professional interviewer, I get like hypercritical and I notice a lot of things that I think most people wouldn't. And there, and you do run a risk of like, not necessarily being able to enjoy it in a pure way. Yes and no. I think there was probably a time in my life when listening to like, for example, new music or something. I was, um, I think when I was younger, um, I was, I would listen to new music and it would cause me to have an existential crisis of like where my place in the current world of music is or something like that. I know a lot of people who have that. I've heard so many people who like all all of a sudden like have an auto tune record come out and it's like, you know, maybe you shouldn't have been listening to that stuff. (laughs) Yeah. You shouldn't have been listening to the last Ariana Grande record so much, but yeah. Or, and I I have some actor friends who are the same with like, where I'm like, what are you watching on TV lately? And they're like, nothing. I don't want to like see that it's sort of it's a reminder of your insignificance in the in the greater scheme of things i don't i definitely don't feel that way anymore and actually in probably i would say in the last 5 years i've really it's maybe my time i've gotten the most into new music i don't know if it's just a, a better crop or something right now but i'm like um i like a lot of new stuff there was probably times in my life where i would have been like i only listen to old stuff man or whatever but um it's it's um so i certainly I think as I've gotten older, I'm less likely to to be jealous of the young, cool people coming out because I'm. It's more like I'm excited. Uh, I like a lot of the stuff that's the younger songwriters and and things like that. So I'm not. Uh, if anything, I it doesn't make me think of my place in the world. It makes me realize that I already have my own place in the world. And uh, so, um, but I think that's a that's something that some I think some people have trouble with, and I probably did. At one point, I think I'm rambling uh, on this answer, but um, yeah, I'm a car listener. <laughs> I think that's it. You know, in, in the case of the the Pumpkins record, did you find yourself listening to a lot of their stuff or that album specifically? Or in the case of Bonnie Light Horseman, you know, do you find yourself going back to the anthology of folk music a lot? Is it is it helpful or or you know is it kind of counterproductive to go and really steep yourself in that music? The Bonnie Light Horseman record, we were we we were very steeped in like British folk music and and uh, like, like airport convention we, or yeah, and especially like from we've always said this with the band, and it's totally true is that like Josh and I are Aeneas is a she is pretty bona fide folk ba- you know, and she's she's more known as like a, an actual folk singer songwriter, and and she actually grew up with folk music in her household, and I, I grew up in like a top forty household and and i think josh may be a little similar to me or kind of a class come from classic rock and our our sort of um we know our folk music through the the side door of the grateful dead and the birds and and then and from for both of us later things like fairport convention and incredible string band and um so we did yeah we did a but we also were like we we said time and time again bonnie horseman is not a research project so we didn't want to like go too deep either it's just like it it just sort of it worked how it worked um but i love to listen to music and be that's my favorite way to listen to music is certainly music i feel like i can take something from um which is uh um and that could mean a whole lot of things from a production aspect or a songwriting aspect or something like that but i want to feel inspired and like and a little scared and that's why some of these 
really good songwriters and stuff nowadays you hear i i um i love it because it it kicks my ass in a way of like oh wow this is so good i need to i need to like get back to the drawing board and write better the flip side of it is is, you know like i've heard the today uh single and that that that's up on spotify now and it's like clear that you weren't it's clear that you want to go in a very different non corgan esque direction with that recording. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. There's no, A, there's no, uh, and I actually did a full podcast on this yesterday, uh, the smashing pump cast, the, um, smashing pumpkins podcast. So what else would you name it? That's literally, that's the only name. I, it is the only name. I did a very deep dive on this yesterday, so it's kind of fresh in my mind talking. I was not, ex- A, not expecting to ever talk to anybody about this record. I had, I, I'm so uh, impressed that people are interested in it. I, it seemed like it was going to be such a lark. Of course they are. I mean, one, people just like, they have a soft people spot. People are interested in everything. In that record yeah. <laughs> specifically. But, but, but there is, there's something fascinating in, in, you know, not only just doing a full record of covers, but like, but that record specifically. Yeah. I, um, I, a, I knew there was absolutely nothing sonically I could recreate from that record yeah. that, that a would be, doable for me because it's a butch fig record with billy corgan's incredible guitar sound jimmy chamberlain's incredible drumming i'm doing it in a 10 by 10 extra guest bedroom and you know with a with a two a two channel interface and it's just like it's going to be a bedroom record no matter what it literally is a made in a bedroom so i knew i wasn't gonna be able to do that anyway and who wants to hear that um and it it would be weird yeah it's not, it's not like they deleted all the copies of siamese stream off of spotify yeah like, <laughs> yeah and maybe i mean that would be a deep thought experiment to be like i'm truly going to do a note for note version and try to recreate everything as best as i can it would just probably be terrible it would be like the um, um the gus van sant uh psycho psycho yeah yeah the the shot for shot psycho i thought i thought of that actually but yeah so i um there's yeah there's some songs that are there's maybe like two or three songs that are kind of close. Um, but for the most part, I was like, the sky's the limit with this. My sort of concept was to treat it like the dream version of these and uh, and sort of do it a little bit from memory almost um, rather than... Uh, I, I listened through it once. I got the lyrics and that was pretty much it. And then I just kind of was like, I just started them like I had written a sketch or something like that. So they're all obviously something like today where I turned it into a waltz and it's acoustic. Of course, I, that song is deep within everybody's memory. So that was quite consciously different, but everything else was a little bit like, yeah, I just made it my own. Would you do it again? Not with that record, obviously, but would, would, would you do another front to back? I thought about that today for some weird reason. And I was like, yes, in like two years <laughs> or something. But I, I feel like I, w- I would, I would maybe have. I'm, I am more prepared to do it now since I've done that. But yeah, I would probably do it again. Depends what, on the record. I would. What would you do? Do you get a sense of like what you could or would want to spend that much time with? I don't know. Siamese Dream made a lot of sense because I was like, you know, people who know my music. If I did some kind of cool '70s record or something it's going to be very obvious if you did like bad finger or something yeah exactly which i love but it would it would be you know some kind of completely obvious reference yeah. that that already is like in my dna yeah. you can tell something that you couldn't actively not sound like if you tried yeah and then i kind of had like i was like maybe i should pick i should pick something from my youth i thought a little bit about like doing like a hair metal record because i loved that kind of music when i was like 12 but i was like that's gonna there's no way that's not going to be construed as silly or a parody or a joke and it would be probably pretty hard to like sustain uh thinking about something like that for a really long time for 12 tracks or something and then so i just i flashed forward in time like three years you know from the heavy metal era and i was like what's what's something from that era that i have a deep connection to but that no one would suspect um has anything to do with me and that was that was the one that came up 